What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. Hard to Tell podcast, episode 175, Dexter Henry Bryan, Fonseca here, another week, another episode of the podcast, and we have, you know, we had a lot of guests last month, and then it was just me and Brian the last couple of episodes, but we've got a guest this time, good friend of the podcast, but first time appearance, uh, my former co-worker at News 12, still works at News 12 as an anchor, sports anchor and reporter. My man, Dan Serafin. Let's bring Dan in. Dan in Hello. New Jersey. What's up, uh-huh. man? How you doing? How you doing, gentlemen? It's it's a pleasure to be here. Dexter, of course, we've worked together for uh, for a while there. And uh, Brian, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice bond you make with somebody when you wait so long to hear Justin Hamilton speak after a Nets game in a locker room. So <laughs> me and you, I feel like we have a great relationship also. So it's great to be here, guys. <laughs> Wow, that is a that is a name. Holy shit! I have other ones. <laughs> Look, yeah. yeah, no, it's true. We were there during the Yogi Ferrell days. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> where, where Kenny Atkinson was, you know, everyone be patient with Spencer Dinwiddie, even though he can't score, and then he averages twenty two points a game several years later. I mean, right. like, well, you, been you through got, it. You guys really had to uh, wait out for some quite some people there, and uh, Dan Look, and I. Ch- Jeremy Lin was the best player on an NBA team that year. Okay. Well, remember that, that press conference that, that day, of, what was it, four or five years ago? It was the Anthony Bennett. It was Justin Hamilton. It was a whole lot of guys. And it ended up the only guy, really, the only guy out of the whole press conference was Joe Harris. He ended up being a player. And it was still obviously around now. But there was, you know, that was when the Nets were just kind of throwing anything against the wall and seeing if it stuck. And uh, it's interesting how we're here now with what two of the top five, definitely top 10 players in the NBA in Brooklyn for this team now. And, Absolutely. and, and I profiled of all people, Anthony Bennett that day. There you go. Uh, right. That was the first Nets profile player I ever, uh, or the Nets, the first net that I ever profiled uh, when I was doing some writing in Nets daily. And, you know, didn't turn out what we thought it, possibly could have been or actually it did turn out how <laughs> some people thought it could have been uh i actually thought he was a good rebounder given the minutes that he played but you know he he he's not even i don't even know where anthony bennett is right now but shout out to him wherever he is yeah that you guys uh I, i'm not reminiscing for the, the coverage of the days and, and dan and i and we'll, we'll get to this in a little bit more we'll talk on the nets but dan and i have spent uh many times waiting on other players and coaches around high school sports for many different things o- over the years uh, here in New York City. But Dan, I've known Dan uh, for, I don't even know, I can't even put the years on it, a long time, long enough uh, covering high school sports and then working with him at News 12, uh, doing all sports and stuff, and even when I did news. So always been a great guy to make me laugh and tons of trips in the car, going to different games, talking about a bunch of craziness. Uh, right. Dan, I'm glad, I'm glad to see you because I haven't seen you in person in a, quite a while. Um, so I'm glad you're doing well. We talked and we had a really good conversation last month on the phone, but we got to ask because you're a local sports reporter um, doing news on local TV and things really changed for people doing local sports when the pandemic hit last year a lot. I mean, local news period had to reinvent stuff really quick because the news never stops. We know this. Um what has that experience been like for you adjusting from how things were in 2020 to where things are now in the coverage of, of local sports in New York City? Yeah, I mean, changing, yeah, because, you know, we tell stories, yes, but most of the stories we told were around the action, around the games, you know, and around championships or heartbreak or what have you. And literally, you know, one day there was games, the next day there wasn't games. So everything had had to start over, not even start over, just, just change. So, so that kind of became our beat was 
gyms are closed, sports are obviously not happening, you know, school's not happening. What are these what are these kids doing? And that became the story. And obviously everybody that plays high school sports and and you know, not just high school really, what we're talking about here. Um we kind of broke down my uh my colleague Pat O'Keefe uh at News 12. There was kind of three levels of every high school athlete, right? You have your 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 first level is what, you know, I'll be honest, I was playing high school sports. I just like playing sports. So I played. I knew I wasn't going anywhere, you know, <laughs> going, going to college to play sports or anything, just play to have fun. And if you didn't have high school sports for the past year, you didn't have high school sports. Those kids missed out. I mean, all three groups missed out. The next group is, you know, your, your, your lock college athletes, your D1, definitely going to play big time college sports. And it's obvious what they miss are missing out on. They, they need that tape to get recruited. They need to put some highlight tapes together and put some highlight plays together and send it out to coaches and get their scholarships and move on to play college sports and maybe even farther than that. And then there was those those fringe guys, right, that maybe guys and girls that maybe maybe could get a scholarship if everything went right. And, you know, they got a little bit of luck and they have a lot of skill. And and so all three of those groups suffering during the last year we took it upon ourselves to tell the stories of these are what these kids are doing. A lot of kids transferring schools. We talked to kids that transferred schools more than once over the past year, just trying to get somewhere where they could play high school sports, whether that be in a neighboring state like New Jersey or Connecticut or what have you. We told those stories. We told the stories of kids that just couldn't do anything. They just threw their hands up. They lost a year. You know, so so even though the action on the field stopped. There was plenty to talk about off the field, Dexter and Brian, and that kind of got us through a lot of the year. And then I guess as we got to January, February, March, when we were actually talking about, you know, a plan to get back to action, that kind of took over. And, and here we are now where, you know, we got we got most sports, if not already up and running, getting very close, practicing, conditioning to to having some action shortly. How antsy. Oh. Uh, go, go, Brian. I was going to ask, like, real quick, what do you think – because I'm curious about this, and this is something I thought about during the pandemic. What do you think the long-term effects could be for some of these high school kids who, you know, especially the guys who were, and women who were juniors before right. this, and now are seniors trying to get recruited, trying to, you know, figure out where they're going to go to school, regardless of whether or not they get a scholarship and how that affects them. Like, you know, what are some of the things that you've heard in terms of how that could sort of linger for the immediate future? And after that. It's definitely going to be an uphill climb for, for the, the people that you're talking about. From face value right on the start, right? Loot them, themselves, losing a year. You know, sport, a sport like football. You know, we know basketball players and, and, you know, baseball to some extent. A lot of other sports. You know, high school isn't your only route. You know, basketball players, we know all about the AAU circuit, the AAU season. That That's going to probably happen, uh, if not 100%. Like it used to, very close to it in this summer, and you know, all after the school year ends. But if you're a football player, you rely on high, your high school. That's it. There's no AAU football teams that are going around. Your high school football season is it. That's your chance to shine. That's your chance to make an impression to college scouts. And you know, a lot of these kids are having brief high school football seasons with their teams now in the spring. And like you said, you're a junior right now. You're playing high school football right now. If you're in a Catholic League, you're playing a four-game season. If you're in a public school in New York City, we don't really know what that season is going to look like, but it can't be much longer, I would imagine, than four games. Then you're going to turn right around, and you're going to get ready for your fall season. So, so you got to imagine this is going to be – this is a tall order. You know, this is not normal, and nothing is normal these days, obviously. But, you know, that's the first part of it, you know, the, the, the uphill climb just for themselves. Then you look at what colleges have done, where colleges have said – Okay, if you're a college athlete right now, you just get another year. You know, regardless right. of what the situation is, we're not going to ask any questions. You can just come back next year and play again, and that's it. So now you got a log jam getting into college. You know, a certain college might have a certain amount of scholarships to give out, but the the kid that was a, ju a senior last year that would have graduated and moved on and and left the college team, well, he's not doing that anymore. He's staying. He or she is staying there and taking up that scholarship again for another year. So those kids that are coming up from from high school, less opportunities there. So it's really an uphill climb, Brian, for for these kids, you know, in in more ways than one. And you know, and, and that's just on face value. You know, the other part of this story, 
was kind of like everything you didn't think of, right? Okay, high school sports getting back into action. Okay, let's figure out how to do it, right? In the pandemic, let's figure out how to make sure kids are safe on the bench and while they play. Well, that's not all of it. How do you get to games? You know, when if you're going to a road game and you take one bus normally and you pack everybody into a bus and you drive to, you know, Lincoln High School to play your road basketball game against them, well, now you might need two buses or three buses with social distancing. And and how are you going to make sure everybody stays safe? You know, things that normally, and even me, who's kind of been in this for a while now, you don't even think about, but now oh. it needs to be changed. And so kind of everything's been kind of just flipped upside down. And and, and that's, that's the part of getting back to action that we kind of knew, you know, this wasn't going to be easy. You can't just snap your fingers and say, okay, go out and play. We're good. Let's go. It's not that easy. It's difficult. And I'm sure these athletic directors and coaches are running into more and more problems as they move forward. Not, not, not necessarily problems, I guess, but, you know, questions that need to be answered and, and conundrums and stuff like that, that, you know, they never thought they were going to encounter, you know, ever. And now here we are. 2021 right that's this is what this is the life we live yeah this is what it is and these are the challenges they face and it, there's going to be stories around that too you know dan going forward just be the return and how that how that's going to work but i guess the last thing on this i'd have to imagine for you and pat and Craig and my guys who are working in these 12 Brooklyn bronx there had to be this desire strong desire to return back to action right to get back and see games on the field again and talk to athletes and coaches because this is what we love to do as sports journalists, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of towing that line. And you mentioned the conversation we, we had about a month ago. It's, you know, obviously I want to spend my, I mean, March, March is kind of it for us, right? High school basketball season kind of cuts the end of the regular season. Very good always. And then the playoffs and the Catholic League and the PSAL, they usually seem to last for like months and months and months. But but it's always great every night because every game has stakes and and that's what we're here for, you know, to, to watch these athletes perform with a little bit of pressure on them. And we haven't gotten that now for, for two years. So it's, it's not fun, you know? I mean, <laughs> part of our kind of mental clock, at least for myself speaking, of a year through a year is, okay, when March comes, I'm going to be logging a lot of hours, but I'm going to be having a hell of a time doing it and having fun watching – you know, great moments on the basketball court. Actually, I remember one of the last things we covered was a Catholic League archdiocesan semifinal game between Stepanak and St. Ray's at Mount St. Michael. There had to be more than 1,500 people in the gym, jam-packed. Which probably wasn't game. safe at that point. <laughs> right. It was, yeah, <laughs> beginning of March. We, yeah, we, we didn't know much. But, yeah, a, a jam-packed gym. But just a great game. And I actually have the highlights still on my laptop that I work at home from. And I found myself every once in a while just kind of watching it and remembering what, what this used to be like. And, and yeah, I, it would, I would love it if we could just go right back to, to how things were back then and play the high school football season now and, and have a full one. But that's just not in the cards. And, and you know, I guess the, the route to get back there is something that we've been covering. We've been telling that story. We plan on continuing to do so because now – now the story kind of becomes, we get back. Now what, right? It's not a lot of these kids. A lot of these kids got to stay in shape and stay, you know, at their peak condition physically. But a lot of them didn't because it just wasn't possible. Obviously, you know, gyms are closed everywhere. Schools were closed. It was hard to do that. So, how do we get back here? You know, and you know, adversity. I feel like is the place where we kind of live, right? Adversity mm. and overcoming it. So there's plenty of it going around these days, and we like telling the stories of, hey, this person faced this adversity, and they beat it. So we'll hopefully do a lot of that in the coming months. Some are always looking for more sports content, and among the glut of sports media, some are looking for sports content that dives a bit deeper and doesn't just stick to sports. So check out Backpack Broadcasting's original long-form sports journalism series, Sideline Stories. The award-winning original series takes viewers directly into underrepresented communities within the world of sports. It's a series that goes beyond traditional sports reporting, like box scores and statistics, presenting exclusive stories that you won't find anywhere else. With a diverse group of correspondents, the series provides interviews and interesting stories around the world of sports, because there is so much beyond the game, and so much that occurs off the field or court that impacts each of us and the world we live in. 
giving a voice to athletes, coaches, fans, and everyone involved in athletics, Sideline Stories looks to push sports storytelling further than ever before. It's a winner of the 2020 Independent Shorts Awards, and all episodes of Sideline Stories are available for viewing today on Backpack Broadcasting's YouTube channel and Facebook page. I'm going to shift gears here, which I never thought I would do on this podcast. We're going to have an extended, yeah, we're going to have an extended conversation about wrestling, all right? And I, I got to ask Dan this question. I think most people who listen to this podcast, watch this podcast, you know, I'm not a big fan of wrestling at all whatsoever. I don't think it's a sport. I don't care about it in the way that Brian does. I'm not getting excited. Brian wants me to get my daughter into watching wrestling, wants her to be jumping off the top turnbuckle, all this stuff that he wants. But I got to ask you, Mr. Seraphin, I know that you and our good friend Kurt Sender at News 12, I know you guys love the wrestling, or the wrestling, as my aunt used to say. Uh, is, is wrestling a sport? Uh, do, do, you, do you get excited about events like WrestleMania the way you would for Game 7 of the NBA Finals or Game 7 of the World Series? Does it get the juices flowing for you like that? Well, I, I never thought of it like that. I mean, it's, and first of all, Brian will back me up. Is I'm wrestling? Sure, a, I'm sure. Is wrestling a sport? Is just such a loaded question. I mean, for, and, and second off, it doesn't really matter if it's a sport. I don't know. I mean, I guess I I look at it more of it's you know. Back in the day, I would watch Beverly Hills 90210. I would watch, you know, take your pick of TV drama. This is this is just like that. It's a TV drama, and there's plenty of athleticism involved, and. You know, a lot of fun stuff to watch all the time with what these guys do in the ring when they perform. Uh, and and please, Brian, jump in whenever because because uh, you know I'm sure it's going to take a lot to convince Dexter to to start watching and oh, attending. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> hold, hold on, hold on a second. It, on, on the last podcast, I, I right. vowed to do this, and you should know this too. I'm going to make a concerted effort to watch some wrestling this year, and I'm trying to shed biases we all biases right like we this, this right. all is this and i've had some to wrestling and i'm trying to shed it and watch it with an open mind and mm -hmm. I, I haven't got to doing it yet but i i do plan to plan to do it so it's gonna happen okay. but i know i know you guys are gonna do your tag team thing here and you know gang on me so it, it well, is what it is. i've always referred to uh wrestling as a live action movie uh, slash with, an art with form bad, with, with bad acting, but yeah. Sla look, look, there are actual movies that have bad acting. Some wrestlers could actually act, some not as much. You know, it's that's true. It's not, it's not I, I, even, try, I try to not watch those movies, but I get your point. It's not an even playing field. I mean, look, John Cena's now you know developed a successful acting career, and he was really good in Trainwreck. So, like, you know, we got to give him props for that. You know what I mean? Yeah, the Rock is his own. The Rock is its own thing. Stone Cold, you know. Like I'll pass. he's he, he's better on he's an excellent podcaster and he's a great host of his TV show acting a little bit different but whatever oh uh, now as far as like the sport goes or the comment about it whether or not being a sport I think it's a sport just in a different sort of way because of the athleticism it requires obviously the uh, results and such uh you know predetermined whatever scripted and all that shit. Yeah, but still, the athleticism alone, you train like an athlete, you perform as if you're an athlete, like it's all the same thing, and you have more of a rigorous schedule because you really don't have an offseason, which actually is its own issue, but, you know, we'll get to that another time, I suppose. I suppose, I just, I suppose we will. Uh, <laughs> you're looking forward to that. I, uh, I am. <laughs> I, look, I mean, there. yeah, like Brian said, there's good actors, there's bad actors. I, I watched plenty of, you know. Dexter, you, you you watch your share of uh, children's TV, I'm sure. Oh. You know, if you're watching uh, Jesse on on Nick Jr., you know, not everybody on there is a great actor. Not everybody in wrestling is is a great actor. But and I agree with Brian. You know, the only thing to me that's keeping it from being a sport is the fact that the results are predetermined. So, uh, you know, the sports entertainment moniker that the WWE had kind of you know, adopted and created, it's accurate, right? I mean, it's sports and it's entertainment. But these guys, you know, different from your regular actor or actress, you know, they get one shot every time to do it. It's in front of, a, well, of, except for the past year, of course, it, a live audience 
air every single night. You know, you get it wrong once, you know, you know, the, the, the audience knows you could seriously injure your opponent or yourself. You know, oh. so there's there's a lot of skill involved in this. It's not just any, you know, any Joe sports fan off the street can just go in there and be a professional wrestler. Right. It's years of training. It's years of training to be a wrestler to, you know, in the gym. And, and you know, this is this is performance at, at Brian. Would you agree the highest level? No, but that, but that, but that's why, I, but that's why I think it's harder because of what you're saying about it being live all the damn time. Like right. AEW is live, uh, Raw is live, SmackDown is live, and they're not on small like platforms. You know what I mean? Like they're not on, they're not on some thing that you never heard of. They're on USA and Fox, like not even FS1, but Fox now. Right. 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 And then you also have the pay per views that you know their pay per views like WWE Network. And now they're going to be on Peacock, which is, you know, an NBC affiliate. Like, th- and you're doing all of this live. Like, no- nothing is pretty much taped anymore. And I think I that's what makes it harder also because if, like, if, if first of all, if if they were skilled actors, it would probably, you know, it, it would probably be a little bit different in terms of how certain things were executed. But at the same time, I also think that the writing has to put them in positions to do so. And before we get into the acting portion of it, a lot of people in wrestling communities, they've criticized the writing for years and in a lot of cases, justifiably so. I, I can I can see that. I think Dan makes a good point. I said this on the last podcast. And Dan, I think I told you about this. We we had worked on something for sideline stories that hasn't been released yet in uh, around wrestling and, and spoke with a local wrestler and we and brian and i i got to see and this is somebody who was kind of like oh, i don't really get into the wrestling the work that was put into it in all seriousness i saw the work that was put into it and how you can't bullshit the fans like right. the fans are going to know if you do a certain move and you don't bring it but the right. other question i have to ask you dan is Brian, Brian's sell on me to watch wrestling right now is to get my daughter to watch. And he tries to sell me on the fact that there is a rise in black stars in wrestling. So, you know. And like, women. And he, women. This is the best the women have he's, ever been. He's appealing, to, oh, yeah. he's appealing to me seeing people who look like me. But you, uh, as my white friend. You can. What? Why would you think Dexter should watch wrestling? Like, what is Dan Seraphin's sell on Dexter to come in and watch this sport? To be entertained, Dexter. Just to be entertained, you know. Um, and, and I have to mention, you know, as much as and now I'm talking myself into it, even even though I've been watching for, <laughs> geez, too long, thirty one years, I think, probably thirty two years, something like that. Um, the sport aspect of it is also why I'm a fan. Like before this year, obviously, when they were, you know, they tour the country, they tour the world, you know, all these arenas, all the arenas, you know, if you're a basketball fan, you know, Barclays Center, you know, Staples Center, you know, American Airlines Arena. And and these are all venues that the WWE will tour through. And and through that, you know, you, you kind of, if you, if you want to go this route and I do become kind of a, a stat nerd about wrestling, right? This guy won the belt. Last time he he wrestled at Staples Center. This guy was, you know, here and he did this at this at this venue. So you can take your, you know, love of, you know, if you're a basketball fan and you like crunching numbers and doing stuff like that or looking at, oh, this playoff series, you know, this guy did well at this arena, this at this place. You can do that with wrestling too. You you can it, it's once you get involved, Dexter, you realize it's it has a lot of sports qualities in watching it. Am I wrong, Brian? I mean, I feel like you're you know, absolutely right. Yeah, and even like WrestleManias, you know, and, and as they've kind of moved to the more football stadiums or, or big ballparks mm-hmm. and stuff like that, it adds a whole nother. You know, oh, these guys are used to competing in front of well, well, you know, when they start wrestling, they're used to competing probably in front of like ten or fifteen people at like the local VFW hall. Now, you know, WrestleMania, uh, what thirty WrestleMania thirty five, MetLife Stadium. 80,000 yeah. people, 90,000 people. Yeah. You think, and, and that affects their, their match, right? right? These people that have never competed in front of 80,000 people before, they just, you know, just walk out there and just say, oh, no, this is cool. I got this 80,000 people. No problem. No, that, that's all part of it. You know, the, the mess ups and, and the screw ups, like we said, it's in front of a live audience. And, and don't think they don't happen. They do all the right. time. You know, right. and, and oh, that's that, part of it. Yeah. It becomes part of the history. It becomes part of the things that me and Brian will talk about when we get together and say, oh, did, did, did you see Sheamus try to try to give his move to Riddle in the WrestleMania match? And 
and just oh, decide, yeah. no, I'm bailing on it and jumping off the top rope instead of possibly jumping off and, you know, breaking his neck. Oh, you know, it all becomes one. part of it. There's so many different facets. And if you just want to watch it just to kind of be entertained, Dexter, you can do that. If you want to get into it in depth, you can do that. It's, it's very much, I think, you know, like regular sports, if you want it to be. And, and some people that are sports fans and, and maybe not wrestling fans would say, you're full of it, Dan. But. You know, it's to each his own, right? Yeah, I'm but, not, but here's the thing. I'm not here's the thing. That anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. I, I don't think. I don't think Dan's full of it because, like, we talk about quarterback speak and people giving non-answers and sports and things of that nature. And what is it that people more so want? They want their athletes to act like professional wrestlers because that would be more interesting. Like, there's something that comes along with that. And I would also say, Dexter, like, if there's an if if you wanted to watch wrestling just for a good laugh, like, I would suggest you getting into Botchamania. Is this a phenomenon that I've ever told you about before? <laughs> well, look, I'm I'm willing to look at this and, and just attack it with an open mind. I'm going to have to try to attach myself to some wrestler. Because when but, I was young, but, so when, but, but, when but I was have you heard, I liked but have the you, Ultimate Warrior. That was my you, guy. But have you heard of Botchamania before? Have no, I, I, have no I, I know nothing about Botchamania. I am lost on Botchamania. Okay. Uh, school me on Botchamania. So Botchamania. Uh, I was... Does Dan, Dan, do you know about this? Of course. Of course. He has to. Dan oh, has yeah. to know. Yeah. I'm like, who, like who, who am I talking to here? Right. Okay. B Botchamania started in like 2006 because I remember the first edition being on E-Bombs World. And oh, uh, right. You're the name yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So I remember finding this in like middle school. And what it was is this dude named Mafu, A M A F F E W from I mm. think somewhere in the UK, just started compiling these videos of when wrestlers mess up and it became really funny. And he's been doing it for like 15 years. I would actually love to get him on the podcast to talk about this. He's been doing it for 15 years. They're really hilarious, a lot of inside jokes. Uh, has its own community, has done over 400 of these, well over 400 of these, just dropped the newest one that came out right after WrestleMania, which has a lot of stuff from WrestleMania because as good as WrestleMania was in terms of the quality of matches up and down, there were a lot of mess ups, as Dan alluded to, with the Sheamus one, and you know there were, there were a bunch, basically. Um, yeah, if you saw Botchamania, which uh -huh. me and friend of the show, Matthew Feniza, have talked about before, actually. If you watch Botchamania, you might get interested in a different sort of way because, you know, Botchamania is actually quite hilarious. And it became its own kind of kind of segment, right? Like its own beat, right? Because I know I follow on Instagram WrestleBotch, and those kind of pump out. I, I think it's, it's Mongo Mondays, right, with, with, with Steve McMichael, <laughs> yeah. the former Chicago Bears uh, defensive lineman who was a part of the infamous 4-6 defense back in 85 when they won the Super Bowl. And he became a wrestler after his football career. And you could tell he was kind of, you know, he was a wrestler, but he didn't know the physics. And there's a lot of, mm. it, of brain stuff, you know, like how to build the match and how to make it look believable and how to, you know, grab the crowd and bring it with you. And, and you know, you could tell by watching these clips that he was kind of just maybe winging it. And, and you, you could kind of just go down that lane, like Brian said, and, and that could just kind of be your thing. You know, oh. you just watch these botches and be like, what is this guy thinking? What what is he doing? It you know, it'll make you laugh and it's you know uh, and, and Dexter, if you're gonna start watching, yes, you know, just just watch. You don't have to I, that's my advice at least. Just, just watch just let your just let your mind wander. Just you just know watch. What? Maybe I, that's I, what I, that's I always what. I always tell them because I've never I've never told Dex yo watch Raw or SmackDown. I've always said watch that's NXT. True. Or watch one of the pay-per-views because that's mm -hmm. really all I have time for now. Like I, yeah. I have Raw on right now as we're recording this on a Monday night because I mean, you know, what else would I put on? But I don't actively like watch Raw in the way that I used to every single week, just right. because like one, it's very time-consuming. Like the three hours is hard, and two, right. it's just not like top to bottom that good usually for me to right. pay that much attention to it. But NXT is consistently good all the time, and that's sort of the next generation of wrestlers. So Triple H runs it. They care about wrestling a little bit more. And then with the pay-per-views, I mean, that's the big show. And, you know, with Peacock, if you have access to Peacock, WrestleMania just ended. It's a logical uh, point to sort of look at. So, and I would, I would suggest that Simone watch the Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair match. I, I'm, 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 I'm still <laughs> going to do it. I'm going to go back and watch WrestleMania 37. And, Dad, I have a – there's a guy who works at my local Walgreens, 
And it was a day, this was last year, two years ago. It was pre-pandemic, might have been two years ago. I walked in there one evening, I was picking up some items. He's watching NXT on the phone, unbeknownst to me. And he turns to me and is like, do you watch wrestling? And I'm right. like, no. <laughs> like I said, I said it like that. Like, no, what are you, what, what, are you crazy? Yeah, it's kind of judgy. It's, that's kind of being a dick. But uh, I said, no. And he's like, he's, I was like, oh, but my podcast co-host, big fan. Watch it. He's like, dude, you got to watch this NXT. Every time I come in the store, he's always like, yo, man, so you watch that NXT yet? And I'm like, nah. <laughs> and he's like disappointed. And so right. now I'm not going to have to disappoint him. I Good promised Brian I would look at 37. Um, Brian said 37 was dope. And yeah. everything I The first read night about especially. It, the second the night, not night as good, but the first night was special. Everything I read about it, including some of the storylines, because I did read about it. I'm not going to not be in, informed, but sounded like it was really dope. Was that the same experience for you, uh, Dan? Did you, did you oh, really yeah. enjoy this WrestleMania? And, and I'm in the same spot as Brian. Like, I don't... I, I DVR Raw and SmackDown, and I probably end up every week watching it on three times fast forward. So I take the three hours and I watch it in about seven minutes. No sound, just kind of, <laughs> you know, at whatever whatever still still image is popped up through the fast forward. Okay, I know that. Okay, I got that. And, and the, the build up to this WrestleMania, doing it maybe it was because I did it through three times fast forward. I wasn't very impressed. I wasn't along for the ride that much. But when we got to the the final card, I was excited for it. And, and WrestleMania was probably the first pay per view that I watched. Beginning to end, every match straight through, probably since I went to WrestleMania 35 at Giant Stadium. Mm. Um, you know, and, and Brian will definitely back me up. If you if you do choose to to get in, you got to watch some Royal Rumbles. Those are the best matches every year. Well, see that Royal that was my favorite as a kid. I loved right. the Royal Rumble as a kid. Right, I, that I feel was like, my favorite. I feel like, and, and I used to do this a few years back. We I'd have like a party at my house for the Royal Rumble and I'd invite people that didn't watch wrestling and they would come and enjoy it because, you know, you could kind of gamble a little bit. See, on Dan, Dan, Dan knew not to invite, Dan knew not to invite me then. He's like, Dexter's just going to be the, uh, the angry be the, uh, non-wrestling be downer. The court. Oh, no, ne ne <laughs> next year's, I'm already telling you, next year's Rumble in January is going to be crazy because it's going to be the first one with people uh, right. since, you know, in a while and, I mean, this year they did a pretty good job with the returns and stuff but next year's going to be nuts. Right, right. And and, and uh, what I loved about WrestleMania, you kind of got, everybody got what they wanted on the first night, like you said, Brian. You know, it was, seemed to be, that was a night that, you know, they were going to send everybody home happy. Night two was totally different, and that wasn't the case. And even though Roman Reigns ended up winning at the end, everybody that I was talking to seemed convinced that Roman Reigns wasn't going to win that match. Me and too. I, in the past, had not been a Roman Reigns fan. But obviously now this character, much different. I enjoy him. Yep. You know, just kind of really digging in and being that heel. And, you know, all those years that he won and the crowd was kind of not totally on board. Of course, the infamous Royal Rumble where The Rock came back and still got booed out of the building in Philadelphia. You yep. know, now it seems like he's at the best he's ever been. So it only seemed right to me that he be the ultimate kind of, you know, main event, final night. Biggest Agreed. winner of the of the whole weekend. It seems like if you were going to force him down our throats all those times in years past, now that everybody seems to kind of like where he's at and he's going on all cylinders and he's the best he's ever been, he has to he has to win and hold the belt. Who who was your and Brian? I don't know this about you too because I don't know if you've told me this. We've talked a lot about this, off, but I'm going to ask you and Dan. For me, I told you guys I, I loved Ultimate Warrior growing up. Um, I like Brett the Hitman Hart. Th th those are those were my guys. But I really was an Ultimate Warrior fan. That was my guy when I used to watch wrestling. Who who's the person now that's like, all right, if you're watching wrestling, as somebody who's not watching, you got to go watch this guy or this girl when they get in the ring. They're must see TV. You got to go watch them wrestle. Right now, active. I can get active, I, right now. I have, yeah. a, I have an all time list of my top five that includes a couple of actors. But right people. now, you want me to watch this person, you're like, Dex, you need to go see this person wrestle because they're dope. Who who are you guys saying? I mean, it's got to be AJ Styles, right? AJ Styles is up there. I'm definitely saying Sasha Banks. I was going to say her also. But uh, just like, you know, you, you, you're you going to put a match on randomly. Yeah. What's the, the highest percentage chance that what I'm putting on is going to be entertaining? Yeah. I would say I think our two answers are the answer. It's AJ Styles and Sasha Banks. AJ Styles, AJ Styles, Styles Sasha, Sasha Banks. Banks. And and on I'll give you a bonus because we were talking about NXT. We haven't mentioned an NXT person. Um NXT just has, I mean, 
Adam Cole is awesome. Io Shirai, who just lost her women's title to Raquel Gonzalez. They're both great. The Io Shirai, especially this last year, like she was as good as anybody in the company. Um, yeah, you have uh, Santos Escobar, who I love. <laughs> but, you Latino, know. Latino heritage there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Raquel Gonzalez just won the women's title at NXT, so that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, NXT has a lot of people who, uh, quote unquote, can't miss. But I would say those are the standouts for sure. And on the main roster, as we mentioned, Sasha Banks, I would throw Bianca Belair at this point in there, AJ Styles. And Roman Reigns is, as Dan said, very captivating and the best he's ever been right now. And I'm actually glad he kept the title because I'm like, I don't think anybody should beat this guy yet, honestly. Right. And, and, and that's, that's the other thing. There, there is somebody for everybody. You you know, you, you, you watch. I mean, I remember going to events back in the day and obviously The Undertaker was around for what what they 30 years 30 years right yeah. Uh, yeah and i mean there would be people that you know got into wrestling just because of the undertaker right you know and, and so like i said ultimate warrior undertaker you go through the years you know for me it was always Shawn michaels because i just felt like like you said there was never a bad Shawn michaels match he would get right. in the ring with anybody and it would be entertaining as hell and you'd, you'd, you'd do something you never saw before and it would just be uh, he'd take you on a ride so that was who it always was for me even to this day now today, male, female, race, whatever, there's somebody for you out there. There's somebody that looks like you, and there's somebody that you can, you know, kind of look at and say, if you want to, that could be me one day. I'm glad you actually brought that up, Dan, because from the outside looking in and my conversation with Brian on this, wrestling actually looks a lot more inclusive than some other sports that we have seen throughout when we look at it. Like, if you really think about it, like I said, this is just as me as a not a wrestling fan, somebody who just talks to Brian about this, or maybe you. But mm -hmm. when I see it, and, you know, Brian's been jokingly, but somewhat seriously saying, hey, look, your daughter should watch this because there are some black women out there that are doing some really amazing things. And you talked about how you can find everybody. I do find that dope and intriguing in wrestling that everybody can find people who look like them from all walks, all backgrounds, and I do think that's dope. I really do. Like seriously. That, that, that was not always the case, though. And, yeah. And sure, Brian will crack right. me up on that. Right. You know, yes. I mean, some of the most offensive stuff, you know, ever put on television. <laughs> was in wrestling. Yes. Was wrestling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, but to that point, uh, now they've definitely – they've made some sort of effort, obviously, mm -hmm. to, you know, be more inclusive. But, yeah, like I, I mentioned Santos Escobar earlier, and I was like, yo, I, you know – I look at him and the guys that he has on the stable, and I'm like, hmm, if I was a wrestler currently, that's probably as close as to somebody that I, I see myself being. You know what I mean? Like, he he's short. He's a cruiserweight. He's a heel. He's a dick. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, that's he, definitely you. he's definitely got the total you. package. You know what I'm saying? And I still, and I still, Dan, I still think one day that I could be a, a, a manager on the independent circuit. You know what I mean? I still I think wanna, I could I could execute yeah. that at some point in my career. Oh, I always have to have the dreams of jumping off the top rope just to have somebody who's bigger and stronger than me catch me and then slam me on the ground. You know, I right. just want to do <laughs> I just want to do one move just once. But, but what I will say is, it's interesting also how, like we said, it wasn't always like this. It wasn't always so inclusive. But kind of as we turn the page, and now not everybody is so obviously clear cut. This is the good guy. This is the bad guy. You know, I guess obviously around this, the time of Stone Cold Steve Austin, we kind of moved into everybody's a shade of gray, kind of like in real life, right? Mm. You don't walk around mm. going, "Oh, I'm a bad guy," you know, or "I'm the good guy." No, <laughs> and, and so, and so, is it is it just a coincidence that here we are now? We're in a better place. Everybody's mm. involved, all races, all colors, all genders. It, it, everybody gets represented, and we're in a time where, yeah, not everybody is so clear cut. The good guy or the bad guy everybody's oh. just in it and if dexter wants to pick up and watch yeah maybe maybe he'll like bianca belair maybe he won't maybe he'll like sasha banks better or maybe he'll like becky lynch better and you know it's up to him it's not just like okay hulk hogan he's the good guy he you gotta, you know, gotta root eats for him his, right eats his vitamins drinks his milk and says Great his prayers point. and you gotta like him and it's not like that no more you pick what you like based on you no, that's no. This this is dope, and I, I will have to say that this conversation has encouraged me more 
to watch wrestling. And I think for our listeners and viewers, they're going to be like, Dexter, we never thought that you would talk about wrestling for this long on the podcast. And all it took was getting Dan Serafin to come on the show, combined with the great Brian Fonseca. And, and now look what, look what we have. So, should I apologize? Oh, should, should I apologize? Should you apologize? No, 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 no. I should apologize because I've I've been rude uh, to the sport of wrestling before, so I should apologize. So, Dan, when we get back to normalcy and you have one of your uh, wrestling parties, or like I said, when I, I move and I have a little more space, and I maybe I'll throw the wrestling party, and you okay. come to my house with Brian, and we do that. You're going to be like, look at you, Dex. You're throwing wrestling parties. That's okay. crazy yeah. shit. And, crazy. and then we'll power bomb Brian onto your – daughter's uh, crib or whatever and, <laughs> like, you know and yeah I, I, I never forget sixth grade I'll sell it sixth grade my friend rock bottomed me on my bed and during a pay-per-view event and broke the bed and i had to go tell my parents hey listen uh it was a great party but uh i need yeah. i need a new bed yeah hey, I'm, sure I, the, I'm sure the parents weren't too thrilled about that we, sure. we we definitely had our um our fair share of ladder matches and just oh i did the same <laughs> with my cousin we, we, we did we did we had a we had our fair share our fair share of that, but this is the most we've ever talked wrestling on this podcast. But it was a good conversation about wrestling. Can't be mad at that. Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as three dollars a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Dan here is a uh, lifelong Nets fan. He has rocked with the Nets since they were in Jersey. He is <laughs> stuck with them to Brooklyn. He and I have had many conversations about Nets fans and Knicks fans and their ridiculous banter back and forth, acting like they're rivals when they're not. Um, your Nets, they are second in the East at the time we're recording this. Uh, as you mentioned, they have two of the five best probably players in the, in the league, or at least top six or seven. Um, I'm going to ask you this bluntly, straight out. Brian and I have been talking to some other friends in the group. Can the Nets win the NBA championship this year? Can they? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. You don't, you don't think they can? I, oh, I'm not saying I don't think they can. I, I, I think, think you, know, you know what? You know what? Scratch that question. Scratch the question. Let, let's go okay. with this. Will the Nets win the okay. NBA championship this year? Will they? <sighs> I mean, now you put me on the spot. I mean, I, I would say yes. Who's – are we talking about literally just two teams? Now, wait a minute. Hold on. I know I know Brian. I, I've watched Brian's Twitter feed. I know where – I'll say three. I'll say the Miami Heat maybe. No, I no, no. I, I, hold on. I would say ten. Ten? ten. I would say t- – because <laughs> here's why. Here, ten. I literally said this what? in the group chat. We were just talking about this. Because I think because of all the injuries, the uncertainty, and generally the league has been more wide open these last couple of seasons, I could see – well, I think there are 10 teams who at least think that they're contenders, though I could realistically see maybe a little more than half of those teams actually winning it because I just am skeptical that anyone's going to remain healthy, and I don't trust any of these teams right now because they're all very imperfect. So is there more than three of those teams in the Eastern Conference, according to you? Bucks, Sixers, Nets, and like the Heat and Celtics are like a rung underneath where it's like more things would have to break right. So, you know, they're, look, not all contenders are equal. I think we could acknowledge that. But, I, you know, I can't not – I can't – as much as I shit on Utah and picks and props, I can't say that they're not – contenders i just think right. they're losing in the second round of the playoffs because i think teams like this tend to lose in the second round of the playoffs um you're not, phoenix you're not, gonna the, you're not gonna say the knicks could win it all Fe- no might as well, well they could well, contenders mean, are all different flavors you just said right <laughs> phoenix phoenix i think that they're probably 
you know, also kind of tailor made to lose in the second round of the playoffs because for whatever reason, uh, like that just sort of happens to Chris Paul teams. You know what I mean? Hopefully he breaks that curse because I would like to see Chris Paul play for a championship, but we also have to see Devin Booker, how he performs in games that matter. Like, you know, and then the Lakers, the Clippers, the Nuggets, Portland thinks they're a contender. I think they don't have enough, but we'll see. I mean, it's all over the place. Okay. But back back to the question that we asked Dan. Okay. Yeah. Will they they, they win the championship? And and I'm going to say yes, because I am a uh, a a strong contributor to this episode of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast, and I want to progress the conversation properly. <laughs> yes, they will win the championship. Now, here's how, here's how I look at contenders, right? I take the Western Conference, and I take the Eastern Conference. Who's the best team? In the West, you got to say it's the Lakers, if you're me, as far as I'm concerned, because they won it all last year, and they're no worse than they were last year. In the East, I say the Nets are the measuring post, right? Can the Sixers beat the Nets? Yes. Can the Bucks beat the Nets? Yes. Uh, exactly. Yes. Exactly the sound Brian made. Can the Heat beat the Nets? I mean, they give them a tough time, I think. Yeah. But if you ask Brian that question, the answer for him is yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. But, 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 they have right. everybody. Right. Like, there's, there's, you know, Ast- not asterisk, but like, uh, put it this way: Would I bet on the Heat to beat the Nets necessarily? I mean, I'd probably get a nice chunk of change if I did, and you know, right. as opposed to otherwise. But like, if if gun to my head, right, you have to pick a team that absolutely wins, or you're dead. I'm probably not going to pick the Heat under that scenario. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? Like, that's what it is. Got you. But and, and the Nets have kind of welcomed this conversation, where it's like, okay, yes, Durant. Harden, Kyrie. You put those three guys out there, and in the little spurts we see Durant, you know, the game he played last week, he looks like Kevin Durant. You know, he plays one game a month, but he looks great in that game every month. And it's like, okay, you roll the ball out there, Kevin Durant's going to be Kevin Durant. You roll the ball out there, Kyrie Irving's playing better than you may have ever seen him play. James Harden completely, you know, dominated the, the what, 20-something games after he came to the Nets. So you tell me that all three of those guys are going to be what we expect from them in the playoffs? Yes, the Nets are going to win the whole thing. But because, you know, every week it seems like Kevin Durant, you know, either he's out for a long time or then he comes back and he's injured again. You know, it's kind of this unknown of, you know, the injury bug. Is it going to take a bite out of the Nets in the playoffs? If that happens, then it's a totally different conversation than the one we're having right now. Is that your biggest concern, though, Dan? Is it the injuries or is it the defense uh, of the team, which has been spotty? Like, what is your biggest concern with the Nets as they head towards the playoffs? No, it's it's the injuries because I think the defense, I'm not concerned about the defense because, you know, it's defense scoring 155 points. There's your defense, hmm. you know? And, and when I remember that Nets-Bucks game, and I, I want to say it was right towards the beginning of the season, yep. and the Nets didn't even have Harden yet. It was just Durant and Kyrie. But, you know, and that got late in the game. It was a close game, trading baskets back and forth. But every time the Nets got the ball and they brought it down, you had a really good feeling. At least me personally had a really good feeling that they were going to get a bucket every time they came down the floor. And I can't remember a team, you know, since since this guy right here where it was like, okay, we're scoring here, you know. And I think the Nets – and then you throw Harden in there too. Yeah. (laughs) What's that saying? The best uh, offense is a good defense. Well, maybe the best defense is a good offense for this team. Maybe. And, you know, you always have to talk. And Brian and I have had this conversation, right? Everybody always says defense wins championships. And I kind of hate when people uh, bank on these cliches. Like, remember back when people say you could never win with a scoring point guard? Remember when people used to say that? And then it's like, no, you clearly can. Like, this, <laughs> this, is, this has happened. So you never know. I'm not saying that defense doesn't matter because I think it does. Um, but maybe there is just a, a a point where we're pushing at where there's a team so good offensively that nobody can stop them, and it might not matter. Um, so we will see. Brian, you are Brian. You too, though. Your concern. Brian's bringing up the point. His big thing is availability, and I think that's Brian's overall point about the playoffs. And you're kind of harping on that as well, too, Dan. Uh, uh, with the Nets, do you want to see the team 
all the guys together, what do you need to see over these last 14, 15 games? Like, do we need to see these guys play together? Or you don't care as long as they're healthy for game one of the first round of the playoffs? Yeah. What's, I mean, and, and obviously after that game last week where, you know, everybody seemed to have a rant on the internet or on Twitter screaming and yelling. And there was one guy who used to be a sports talk show host for a AM station in New York city that I'm sure we all grew up listening to him and his buddy, you know, who, who recently retired had this crazy rant about Kevin Durant, not playing in a regular season game. And, and tell me about John Havlicek, not playing regular season games. So on one hand, was that, was that, the, was that the player he mentioned to compare? John Havlicek? Yes, he did. That's I, who he I, did. I had no exact. I heard it oh. on Levitard. I heard it on yeah. Levitard the other oh. day. It was hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, the guy gets more mad about basketball than I've ever been about anything in my life, period. <laughs> um, but that's that's not the point we're talking about. But but what was always the thing we heard about basketball? The regular. Uh-huh. I don't watch basketball because the regular season doesn't matter. Everybody makes the playoffs. The regular season doesn't matter. Okay. So why are we getting all angry when Kevin Durant – doesn't want to play in every single regular season game. I don't care about the game on April 16th. I don't. And especially if you're the Nets, well, they're the two seed in the East. I'm already going to tell you that right now. They're the, they're the two seed. Okay. So why are we, you know, be healthy game one of round one. That's all I care about. Just be healthy. I don't even need to have that much, you know, they say yeah, get used to each other, get out there and play. Yeah, that'd be nice if they played a couple games before the playoffs. But to me, these guys are so good, you know, even if they played, you know, your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn, I feel like they'd still be pretty good just doing that, having no cohesion whatsoever. So, yeah, that's the only thing I'm worried about is the health. And I guess also I would be a little curious as to how Steve Nash and the Nets brass play this. Are they going to give Kevin Durant game three off if they're up 2-0 in the first round? Do they give him a night off? How Do they play that? Do they even sit these guys – in playoff games. It's going it's going to be definitely interesting. You know, I mean, look, as a Brooklyn Knight, it would be interesting to see a parade down Flatbush, um, something I probably never thought I would see. Um, and, you know, it would be nice for the Nets. You know, Dan, you and I have talked about this. I'm not going to be a Knicks fan who's salty if the Nets win a, a championship. I want them to do well. I like to see them do well. You know, I just, you know, try to stay away from the in some of the insufferable Nets fans on Twitter. Not you, of course. But some of the Thank ones, you. and they're insufferable Nick fans too. I try to stay away from. Oh, I want I want nothing to do with them. Dan, before we get out of here, I have to let people know this is this is true, and I don't even think Brian knows this, and Brian might not understand this because of his age. But Dan once told me that he is a fan of a particular show that shocked the hell out of me. Dan, you know what I'm talking about here. I know what you're and talking that, about, and even when he first told me this, I didn't know I didn't realize it was that shocking. It was shocking, and it was a different world. I'm a huge fan of the show Different World. And Dan was the first white brother I've ever met that liked a different world. And I was just like, it was a different world to me to find that out. Um, yeah, man, I just still still shocked about it. Are you watching? Have you re- gone back and rewatched when it was no. on Netflix? Have you have you done any of that? Uh, since? Is it on Netflix? If it was, it, it was. Never came I don't across... know if it is anymore. I think it's on Hulu now or HBO. Okay, Max. yeah, I've never what come across Hulu? it. Um, and, and, you know, the whole streaming world kind of just a couple of weeks ago, it kind of changed. Well, that's right. It was actually when WWE Network moved to Peacock mm-hmm. and it became cheaper, right? We're paying 10 bucks a month for WWE Network. Then it moves to Peacock and they're only paying five bucks a month. So now I'm like, oh, OK, yeah. I'm saving five bucks a month. I'm going to I'm going to invest this in a different streaming service. And I, I started doing research on Paramount Plus and. This Pluto TV I found out about that's absolutely free and has thousands of channels, including channels just geared towards certain shows. Like there's an American Gladiators channel that just plays American Gladiators I'm 24 here for hours that. a day, I'm seven days that. a week. Absolutely amazing. By the way, it's the next 30 for 30 I heard is on American Gladiators. Can't, can't uh, wait for that. Mm. But back to a different world. We all know the spinoff that it was a show of. Yes. Which, show. We, all, which we all watched. Back in the day. So when a different world started, I was all in. And then I mean, I mean, those characters were compelling. Well, what year was that, Dexter? Probably like 88, 89, 87, 90. I think it was 88 or 89 different worlds right. started. Might, so, it might have been 87, but I could be wrong. So like to be honest, I'm five years old in 1988. I probably the jokes probably half of them went over my head. But Dwayne Wayne, one of the coolest guys ever, 
the yep. flip top glasses. Yep. Which I insisted Brian on. My knows, Brian, knows nothing. Brian, Brian knows nothing. knows nothing of this. He's like, what I, 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 I was not even in my dad's balls in 1988. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was a fan of the show that too. Yes. No. <laughs> yes, but, uh, that, that that was always one of my fun facts about Dan, about Dan and, and and learning that and that we both had the love for the show. So I was like, yeah. oh, that's that's dope. You see, can't can't always uh. Just assume that some white folks aren't watching the same shows as you are. You know, can't, can't <laughs> well, well, can, that. And I hate to be the guy that says in my day it was better, but all those 80s shows. I mean, we're talking Webster, we're talking uh different strokes, yep. different worlds. Different worlds. There, I mean, there's no oh, the shows fresh prints, fresh. Would you want to see? Yeah. I'll ask you this. The last thing I'll ask you before we go is. Would you want to see, and I had some discussions with some friends about this who also like the show, would you ever want to see a different world reboot? I don't know how you feel about reboots. I sometimes get annoyed by certain things that get rebooted. But right. would you want to see a different world reboot at all? See, I think you have to do it. If The, the, the shows that just straight up do, okay, this is the show. This is the show you watched back then. We're just going to do it over again with either new people or the same people. Just gonna, I'm not here for that. But like... And I, I go to this because I'm watching it now. Like, if you consider Cobra Kai a reboot of Karate mm -hmm. Kid, that's what I want to see. Take take a couple of your characters from your original show, progress them, and then give me some new characters. I, I'm in for that more than just straight, you know, here's the same story as we told, and now it's 30 years later, and we're just going to tell the same stories again. Same you story gotta put, again. You got to put a little bit of a twist on it a little bit, and then I'm in. I think, yeah, I think it could be interesting to see some new characters maybe going to a fictitious historically black college and how they might navigate things in the world today than they would have differently in 1988 would be yeah, I think it's it certainly be. relevant for the times yeah yeah absolutely. I think it, I think it could be I think there's a lot of relevant stuff they, they could have uh Dan thank you so much we covered a lot from work. the work you're doing at news 12 uh Brooklyn and Bronx which is great you can follow Dan at Dan Serafin and see all uh his great reporting and anchoring News 12 Brooklyn and Bronx. He's going to have a lot of good stuff to cover. We talked wrestling longer right. than I ever imagined I would on this podcast. And you know what? I, respect to both of you. You know, you and Brian, like I said, um, I'm going to look at this op more open-mindedly. I'm going to go in. I'm going to find myself in wrestling. I might be a wrestling fan by the end of this year. Who knows? You don't know what will happen. And, and that you came on here, first person this year to do this. Come on. You predicted the Nets are going to win the championship. So oh, we're going to hold you to that. And if it doesn't, we're going to come for you. Okay. Well, and, and speaking of coming for you, now I came on your show. Now we have a little show that we usually do a couple times a week on News 12. We post on yes. our Facebook page. You guys, Home and Home Series, we got to have you on. We'll, we'll figure out a time and a place to do that. Let's go. Done. You, you, done. You, Dan, you know it. You're, you're always family, and I'm hoping yes. uh, we can see each other again out in the field and not virtually like this soon. Thank you, Work. brother. Appreciate, appreciate you coming on. Thanks, fellas.